Presenting Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airways. CX-4, calling control tower. CX-4, calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower, back to CX-4. Wind, southeast, ceiling 1,200. All clear. Okay, this is Hop Harrigan. Coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. Fellas and girls, let's talk about the biggest land plane in the world. So big it has ten wheels on its landing gear. That's right, ten wheels to land and take off. You've all heard of the B-36, the bomber produced by the Consolidated Vultee Aircraft Corporation. Well, when the first B-36 rolled out of the hangar down at Fort Worth, Texas, it had a tricycle landing gear. The nose wheel was big enough, but the two wheels amidships carried the biggest tires in history. Each one was the height of a two-story building. But the engineers were worried because the B-36 weighs 278,000 pounds, and to put a plane that size down on a runway puts a terrific strain on it. And when that strain is confined to only three wheels, the impact is tremendous. So the engineers kept working on the problem as new B-36s moved along the assembly line, and finally they've come up with the answer. Why not take that huge load and distribute it over the ground? Why not add extra wheels to handle the job? And that's exactly what they did. A brand new B-36 is taking its test flights today, right now, which has eight wheels on its main landing gear. Way up front in the nose, there are two wheels, and in the middle, there's a combination which looks sort of like a caterpillar tractor. Eight smaller wheels lined in two rows. And with that special landing gear, the B-36 now can land on any airport which can take a B-29. A B-36 makes the B-29 look like a Piper Cub, incidentally. I'll be back in a few minutes with some more about the world's biggest bomber, so don't forget to listen. And now to our story. With the startling revelation that Bill King was the man who whistled and who had caused the temporary disappearance of Tank Tinker, the mystery of the vanishing men came to an abrupt and surprising end. As we continue now, it is early the following morning. Hop and Tank, resuming active operation of their airport at Lakeville, are flying a cargo run to New City. With only a moderate load in the Beechcraft, Gale has come along, and as they skim through the clear morning air, they discuss the events of the preceding week. He's so far away now, Hop. Almost like a bad dream. Uh, not to me, it don't. Hey, how do you feel, Tank? Your head still bother you? No. Uh, wallops I got are still kind of sore, but that's all. You should have stayed in the hospital longer. Oh, now you're talking like a nurse. This is doing me a lot more good. Besides, fixing Bill King's wagon was the best medicine in the world. You certainly timed it beautifully. I'll never forget his face when he saw you standing in the hall. Well, that was all Hop's idea. He called up the hospital and squared it with the sawbones to let me go. Hop, I still don't know how you figured it all out so fast. Well, that phone call from the FBI put me straight. When they told me that there'd been no disappearances around the country, they gave me a whole new angle to work on. If Bill's original story was alive, well, then everything else would have to be alive, too. And the pieces began to fit perfectly. You must have been insane to think you could get away with it. Oh, well, he's always been a hot shot idea, man. When Continental fired him and he couldn't get another job, <laughs> something must have snapped upstairs. He just couldn't take it. I still wish you'd have let me punk him one. Now, listen, Tank, the mood you were in, there wouldn't have been anything left to take to the police. Oh, so what? Save him a lot of dough and trouble. I suppose he'll be examined by a state psychiatrist and then committed to an institution. You know, we should have known he had a screw loose the way he started with that black hand routine. Well, now that it's all wrapped up, let's forget it. Easier said than done. <laughs> hey, Gail, how about going out with me tonight? We can visit the carnival and see the fun house. Oh, Carrigan, I never want to see another fun house as long <laughs> as I live. Well, heads up, there's New City. Stand by for landing tank while I call the tower. Check. New City Tower from Beechcraft, NC82043. Come in. Over. Beechcraft, NC82043 from Tower. Go ahead. Over. Approaching field from southwest, three miles. Altitude, 2,000 feet. Request landing instructions. Over. Old course into Lower River. Drop to 1,000 feet and make right-hand turn into pattern. Wind due west. Land on 
runway 25, over. Wilco, spacecraft out. Check in on downwind leg, tower out. Okay, thanks, Gail. Strap in, going down. Long enough to unload and pick up the cargo for Mr. Brody. Why? Well, if there's time, I'd like to do some shopping. Oh, sure, go ahead. We'll wait for you. Down to a thousand. There's the field. Oh, thanks. Watch it now. Banking. New City Tower from Beechcraft in downwind leg. Over. You are cleared to land. DC-4 transport approaching from southeast. Make it fast. Over. On our way. Beechcraft out. Tower out. Wheels and flap tank going into base leg. Gear down. Flap 20. Oh, look, Tom, there's an airliner coming in on our right. Yeah, coming fast, too. Well, we've got number one clearance. It's up to him to slow down. Going into the approach. Stand by. Belt fastened? Yep. Mine is. Going in. The DC-4 don't look like it's going to take the pattern. Oh, if it doesn't, our pilot can kiss his license goodbye. Hold on. Landing. We're down. DC-4 from tower. Pull up and go I'm around. Tower, son. Pull up and go around. DC-4 there for trouble. Now where is he now? Coming straight in, right behind us. Scott, we better clear the runway. You're darn too quick. Let her turn off. We're not up to the taxi strip yet. Well, next to the strip, take her on the grass. Each craft from tower, clear the runway, clear the runway. Hey, hurry up as you're right over us. Hang on. Well, on the call. Right. Oh. Hold tight. Okay, we made it. She went past. Thank heavens, I could have sworn the wing went right over it. It did. Oil. I don't blame him. Hey, heads up. Looks like he's going to pack you right up to the same place we are. I'm watching him. He seems to have control of his ship, all right. I wonder what got into him. I don't know. Okay, here we are. Go on, pilot. Hey, give me a hand, Gail. Thanks. I can make it all right. Hey, careful. Stand clear of his prop blast. Yeah. It's a cargo ship. See the name tank? Ace Flying Service. Yeah, never heard of it. Must be one of them charter lines. Well, I doubt if they'll be in business long. Mm, they got themselves a nice hunk of plane, though. Huh. Frank! Come back here! Come back! Hey, look! Oh, for Pete's sake, Frank, that guy's trying to jump onto the back, ship. He ain't even waiting for the ladder. On, What's Frank. the matter with him? Frank, wait! Wait for me! Pop! Under right there, Frank. face is so white, it's... Why oh, is it so wild? He's starting to run for it. Hey, you guys! Stop him, will you? Stop him! Come on, Tank. Be careful. Uh, Frank, please, come back here. Gosh, she looks like he's off the trolley. Get out. him, Tank. Hold him. You bet. Frank, uh, Frank. There. there. No. No, let, let go of me. Let go. Easy, pal. Easy. Nobody's going to hurt you. Let go. The Jaffy's coming after me. He's going to get me. Calm down there, fella. There's nobody after I you. I saw him. The Zero's after me. I shot him down, and now, now he's coming back. He wants to take me with him. Let go. Let go. His eyes wild and staring, his face a mask of terror, the young pilot struggles wildly, trying to break away, and Tank exerts all of his strength to pin him down. And as Hop tries to help, his blood runs cold at the boy's words. What is this talk about a Jap and a Zero? Gang, you won't want to miss the exciting climax of today's episode, so stand by. <laughs> Gang, you've heard of some of those fantastic stories about big bombers carrying fighter planes of their own right along with them to help fight off enemy pursuit ships. Well, that kind of story is no longer fantastic. No, sir. Consolidated Valtese's new bomber, the B-36, is so big that engineers are seriously considering installing radio-controlled planes right inside the bomber. The fuselage of the B-36 is 183 feet long, and even with a full bomb load, there's still plenty of room for a couple of fighter planes. 
But they won't be ordinary fighters. They'll be drone planes controlled from the mothership by radio. No pilots inside the small ships, only the mechanism for control from the B-36 itself. And inside the 36, technicians are working on a whole new system of gunnery. We can't talk about it now. The Army is keeping it hush-hush. But what we can say is that it's going to be the most terrific firepower ever put into the air. As you've probably heard, the B-36 can fly an atomic bomb anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, drop the bomb, and return to the United States without refueling. Think of that. Add tremendous firepower plus the drones, and you really have something to talk about. Yes, the 36 has about everything. As a matter of fact, fellas and girls, it's even got a roller coaster, believe it or not. The plane is so long that between the pilot's compartment and the rear of the ship, where the gunners sit, there's a little four-wheeled cart and a set of rails. When the pilot, for example, wants to see what's what and back, he climbs on the little cart, gives himself a push, and zoom, he's in the stern of the ship. It's fast, it's easy, and I'll bet a cookie it's a lot of fun, too. Fellas and girls, whether it's a B-36 or a Piper Cub, it's fun to fly. And always remember, America needs flyers. And now, back to our story. Landing at the New City Airport on a routine cargo run from Lakeville, Pop, Tank, and Gale are almost involved in an accident with a massive DC-4 transport, through no fault of their own. Then, on the apron, they see the pilot jump out of his ship and run as though pursued by a ghost. The boys give chase and catch him, but he struggles with the strength born of terror. Let go! Let go! The jet's coming in! It'll blast me right out of the sky! Let go! I, I, I can't pull him! Well, only one go. thing to do, then, I'm afraid. Yeah. The zero's coming straight in! He'll open up in a second! Let me go! Sorry, pal! If... Oh. Nice going, Hop. Couldn't have done better myself. Uh, let him down easy. Boy, for his size, he sure was a handful. Yeah. Hop! Thank you, all right? Yeah, yeah. Take it easy, Jeff. Well, what happened to him? Well, I had to knock him out. Tank, did you hear what he was saying? You mean about the Zero and the Jap? Uh-huh. Yeah, poor guy. Must have been in the Air Forces and ain't got over it yet. Okay, fellas, thanks. I'll take over now. Oh, what's the matter with him? Uh, nothing. Just blew his top a little, that's all. A little? Who are you trying to kid? Look, skip it, will you? Thanks for helping me out, but lay off the questions. Okay, any way you want to play it, pal, but he's in pretty bad shape. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll take him inside. Can we do anything? No. You'd better take him to a doctor. He needs medical attention. I know what to do with him. Now, if you That's don't mind... That's a fine way to talk. We was only trying to help. Yeah, I know, and thanks, but I, I don't need your help no more. Now, do me a favor and roll, will you? Okay. Come on, Tank. Yeah. Who does he think he is? Huh. Maybe we should stay with him. That boy is very sick. I'm afraid we'll have to let them play it out their own way. But I sure wish I knew what was going on. I'd give my right arm to know what made that kid blow up. But as Hop looks back at the still figure stretched out on the ground and at the other pilot bending over him, he doesn't realize that he soon will know what happened. That he and Tank are to become involved in a weird and terrifying mystery of the airlines. So don't miss episode number two of the riddle of the ghostly Avengers. Tune in and fly with Pop Harrigan, America's ace of the airways. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Pop Harrigan is a transcribed copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines. Control Tower, standing by. Control Tower, back to CX-4. Wind, southeast, ceiling 1,200. All clear. Okay, this is Hop Harrigan, coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. 
Fellas and girls, today is the 40th anniversary of the Army Air Forces. And don't think that the men with wings have been sitting back twiddling their thumbs since the Germans and the Japs learned the hard way what it means to tangle with 14 million Americans in uniform. Just recently, the Army Air Forces took a look back at the first six months of this year, and there was plenty there to be proud of. So let's go over a few of their accomplishments so far this year. 1947 was only three days old when Army Air Forces revealed a new rocket-powered underwater bomb, rather like a tiny submarine. This bomb set new speed records for underwater craft. Buzzing through the sea, it speeds up to 80 miles an hour, and brother, on water, that's fast. Said the Army Air Forces, this opens the way to rocket-powered subs or jet propulsion for subs, giving them tremendous speed and long range. So strange as it may seem, the Army Air Forces began the year with a new weapon for the Navy. Then came the new Boeing B-50 bomber on January 8th, bigger and better than the famous B-29. And a few days later, four Lockheed P-80 jet planes completed the first long overwater flight ever made by aircraft of their type, flying from Luzon to Okinawa. On its domestic all-weather transport routes, the Army Air Force has said early this year that it had turned in six months of flying with 98% of all trips completed. And that's only the beginning. I'll tell you more later about the Army Air Forces in 1947, so don't forget to listen. And now to our story. Resuming normal routine operation at their airport, Hop and Tank almost became involved in an accident with a giant DC-4 transport in New City through no fault of their own. And as the massive four-engine plane owned by the Ace Flying Service taxied to a stop on the apron beside them, they saw the pilot jump out and start to run, his face a mask of terror. To the boys' offers of assistance, the co-pilot turned a cold shoulder and almost rudely asked them to leave. Reluctantly, the boys complied. As we continue now, it is late the following morning. A good-sized crowd of people is clustered around the hangars of the Lakeville Airport, watching Hoff and Tank put on a thrilling exhibition of aerobatics in celebration of Army Air Forces Day. Come on, Hop, give him a real lollapalooza now. Make him sit up and take notice. Oh, for Pete's sake, Tank, what do you think we've been doing? Well, we can do better. Come on, turn the ship inside out. That's what I'm afraid we'll do. This beach isn't a sunship, you know. Yes, you do. Let's go. Give him a fair symbol. Okay. Hang on to your hat. Make it a swifty. Stick back. And over we go. can do. I scraped the bottom of the barrel. What about our wind-up? I'm getting ready for it. Stand by the valve. All set. Okay. Going into the first letter. Open the valve. As Tank moves the small lever, Hop jams full power into the ship and roars up in a long, slanting zoom. And billowing white smoke streams out of a long pipe set under the fuselage. For the climax of the performance, the boys are spelling out the words Air Force's Day in the bright, sun-washed sky. On the field below, standing by the steps to their small office, Gail watches the Beechcraft proudly. Standing beside her is Sheriff Quimby. Well, the boys are putting on a good show. Yeah, sure are. Isn't it wonderful, Sheriff? Uh-huh. Let's see, uh, what have they got so far? A I R. They're selling out Air Forces Day. Uh-huh. <laughs> Knew they'd forget something, my gum. <laughs> they didn't dot the eye. Oh. <laughs> Listen to the crowd. They love it. I can't say as I blame them. I don't like it myself. <laughs> there, they finished Air Forces. Sure do right pretty, don't they? <laughs> if you ask me, they do a better job up there than they do on paper. They're starting the last word now. Oh, hey, excuse me, sir. Sure thing. Yes, can I help you? Well, this is the Lakeville Airport, isn't it? Oh, yes. Good. You know where I can find Hop Harrigan? Oh, he's flying right now. Oh? Is he doing the sky riding? Yes. <laughs> I might have known it. They're finished now, Miss Dolan. Well, that's all there is. Show's over. Well, sure was a good one while it lasted. Well, guess I'll be mosey along. So long. Bye. 
Oh, you're Gail Nolan. Yes. Do I, um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't remember ever having met you. You haven't. But I've heard a lot about you. My name's Conroy. Paul Conroy. Paul Conroy. Oh, yes, of course, I remember now. You were in the Pacific with the boys, weren't you? That's right. Well, they'll be awfully glad to see you. I hope so. There, they're coming in for a landing. Let's drop the apron and meet them. Why? Say, the boys have quite a setup here. Oh, it's small, but they're doing a very good job with it. Let's wait here. All right. I thought it was terrible. What? I'm just trying to get a rise out of them. Oh, you did, huh? Now, who do you think you hey, are? Hey, Hank, take it easy. Why don't you guys learn how to fly? Well, you handle a ship like it was a scow. What do you know about it? Hey, look... wait. Hi, Ed Sinker. Remember me? What? It's Conroy. Paul Conroy. Well, oh, uh, big what? button. How goes it? Hop? Oh, fine, Paul. Just fine. Oh, but Jenny's is good to see you. Put it there, pal. I didn't recognize you. Civvies, how are you? What are you doing out? I've gone into business for myself. Oh, good for you. Well, what are you doing around here? Well, I just dropped over to see you and chew the fat. Tell me, how's it going? Oh, just fine. Did you hear about us? Oh, now, wait race? a minute. Let's not start that out here. Come on over to the house, all of you. We'll have some lunch, and then you can talk to your heart's content. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, we'll yeah. lay here. And I guess that about brings us up to date, Paul. As you can see, we haven't had too much spare time on our hands, I'll say. Hey, Gail, can I have another glass of milk and a piece of pie? Mm-hmm. I've been waiting for that. How about you, Paul? No, no thanks. No more for me. Huh? No thanks, Gail. I, uh... <laughs> I see Tank still has his appetite. Oh, nothing <laughs> will ever change that. Here you are, Tank. All right, thanks. Is this your aunt's pie? Didn't you tell me you were living with your aunt, uh... What's her name? Oh, Aunt Agatha. Yeah, she's the best cook in Lake, though. The local ladies' aide is having a luncheon this afternoon. She'll be back later. Well, now, we've been monopolizing the conversation, Paul. How about your taking over for a while? Yeah, what kind of business are you in? Tank, not with your mouth full. You're getting to be just like Aunt Agatha. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what's the score, Paul? What are you doing? Well, I'm a partner in a small airline. We fly charter trips, cargo, passengers, anything. Hey, it sounds good. We operate down south, mainly. Uh-huh. How many ships do you have? Well, we have three right now, two DC-4s and a DC-3. They're converted army transports. Not bad, not bad at all. Well, what's the name of the line? The Ace Flying Service. Paul Conroy quietly voices the name of his airline, and Hop and Gale look at each other quickly while Tank sits absolutely still, a forkful of pie held in midair. They all remember the hysterical ace flying service pilot who almost ran them down the day before in New City. Just what is the connection? We'll know in a moment, gang, so stand by. Now, gang, since today is the Army Air Force's 40th anniversary, it's only fitting that we pay tribute to this great team and its new steps forward in the first six months of 1947. On the 1st of March, an important anniversary was celebrated. The Battle Wagon of the Skies, the B-17 Flying Fortress, first of the forts to take the air, was 10 years old. Under the stars and stripes, these mighty bombers had given a full decade of service, and they're still a vital part of our fleet in the skies, together with their newer, larger sisters. Later in March, the newsy items from Army Air Forces told of two successful test flights. One by the Strato Freighter, the huge high-flying cargo plane that carries more than a boxcar load of supplies or equipment, and the other successful test flight was made by one of the revolutionary jet-propelled bombers built by North American. In April, another jet bomber flew, the Consolidated Volte XB-46. And don't forget, gang, that the Army Air Forces are as interested in personnel as in planes. Right now, a new crop of air cadets is growing up. These young fellows go to flying school, get Army training, and graduate as officers. They're taught to fly the newest planes, from huge bombers to stubby-winged jet fighters. They are the men who are keeping our country in the forefront of aviation progress and making sure that, come what may, the United States will have military aircraft and men to fly them unexcelled anywhere in the world. Until final lasting peace through international cooperation is assured, the men and the planes of our Army Air Forces are the guardians of the victory they did so much to win. 
So on their 40th anniversary, we send our congratulations to the Army Air Forces. And fellas and girls, always remember America needs flyers. And now for our story. Seated in the kitchen of Aunt Agatha's house, Paul Conroy suddenly throws a bombshell into what had been light, pleasant conversation. The name of my airline is the Ace Flying Service. Ace? That's right. Hey, Hop, that, that DC-4 yesterday in New City, the one that almost landed on top of us. Yes, Tank. That was one of our ships. Holy cow, you better teach your pilots some air regulations, pal. Tank, our boys are all veterans who have logged more than 10,000 hours each. We don't have to teach them anything about flying. But but that pilot... He was sick. Yes, you're right, Miss Nolan. I just left him. He's very sick. I don't think he'll ever fly again. Oh, what a shame. Paul, oh, hmm? Feel like telling us what it's all about? Go on, Hop. You know that's why I came here. Well, go ahead. Shoot. Hey, Conroy, did you know your pilot thought a Jap was after him? A Jap Zero. <laughs> Can you imagine? Some pipe dream. It was no dream. He actually saw a Zero. Are you kidding? The war's over, pal. Wake up. Cut it, Tank. Go on, Paul. I spoke to the co-pilot. He was pretty shaky himself, but he wasn't as bad off as Frank. Frank was the pilot. Yes, that's right. Larry the Co. saw the very thing that drove Frank mad. A Japanese Zero. Diving down at them and making a pass, exactly like they did during the war. Oh, I don't believe it. They saw it, I tell you. And not only that, they heard the engine, they heard machine gun fire, and they heard the voice of the Jap pilot. Great Scott. It's impossible. Yes, I know it's impossible. It sounds like a nightmare. But Larry swears it's true, and I believe him. Oh, what did the... the... Jap pilot say? Well, Larry couldn't remember exactly the words that he said, but he identified himself as a Jap that Frank had shot down somewhere over Guadalcanal. He said that he was coming back to exact vengeance. Oh, brother, that's the best one I heard yet. Well, it's true. Believe me, it's true. Well, how can you be so sure? Maybe they were both suffering some sort of, well, delusion. Might be a trace of war hysteria, a hidden neurosis. Yes, I thought so myself. Until I got a phone call from New Orleans this morning. Our DC-3 made a belly landing down there. The pilot was hysterical. Forgot to drop the landing gear. Not because... Yes, Miss Nolan. The only difference being... He'd been in the European theater of operations. He saw a German Messerschmitt. His voice low and intense. Conroy unfolds a weird, blood-chilling story... Hop suddenly realizes all this is no figment of an overworked imagination. Something is going on. Something is happening to the planes and pilots of the Ace Flying Service. But what? Where could former enemy fighters come from? Gang action and suspense pile up thick and fast in the next episode of The Riddle of the Ghostly Avengers. So be sure to listen. Tune in and fly with Hop Harrigan, America's Ace of the Airways. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Hop Harrigan is a transcribed, copyrighted feature appearing in All American Comics magazine. August 1st, our Army Air Forces observed its 40th anniversary. In honor of this occasion, we've invited a special guest to speak to you today. We couldn't have asked for a more colorful member of our Army Air Forces than the one-man Air Force himself. Gang, I'd like you to meet Colonel Robert L. Scott, Jr. Thanks, Glenn, for that fine introduction. Well, Colonel, there's no introduction that could equal your splendid record with the Flying Tigers. I happen to know that at the time you returned to the United States from China, you were America's leading ace with the amazing record of downing 13 Jap fighters and bombers. 
Colonel Scott, I'm sure the fellows and girls would like to know how you first got started in aviation. Well, Glenn, I learned the hard way. When I was 12, I got a piece of canvas and built a homemade glider. Then I climbed to the top of the highest building of my hometown in Georgia and ran down the roof and jumped off. I crashed 67 feet to the ground, but I fell into a rose bush, which saved my life, I guess. <laughs> well, Colonel, I don't think you'd recommend that to the fellows and girls listening in as a good way to start their career in aviation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't, Glenn. You see, that was way back in 1920. Later, I joined the Army and took the exams for West Point. Finally, I went to flying school. And after that, well... And after that, it's all history. Well, you sure did it the hard way, Colonel. But now it's time for us to join Hop Harrigan. Gang, Colonel Scott will be back to tell of some of his exciting war experiences. So don't forget to listen. And now to our story. Perplexed by the fear-crazed behavior of the pilot of a large DC-4 cargo liner... Hop, Tank, and Gail Nolan were unable to do anything to help him, and so tried to forget the entire matter. However, a sudden surprise visit by Paul Conroy, a good friend of War Day's, who now owns part interest in a charter airline known as the Ace Flying Service, has brought the incident to the forefront again. As Paul explained... He was a terrific pilot with over 10,000 hours in the air. But the doctor says he's lost his nerve completely, and now he's all washed up. Oh, what a shame. But gosh, seeing a Jap Zero and hearing a Jap's voice sounds to me like he went haywire even before he made that flight. No, Tank, he was perfectly all right. Besides, the same sort of thing wouldn't happen twice. Don't forget the pilot of the DC-3 that cracked up in New Orleans last night. He said he saw a German Messerschmitt. Well, maybe he heard about what happened to the other guy, and it sort of, well, put a B in his bonnet. No, no one knew about the first pilot seeing the Zero Tank. I put a lid on it as soon as I got the report. Paul? Yes? Did the boy who saw the German plane hear a German voice, too? I don't know. I haven't talked to him yet. He's waiting for me in New Orleans with orders not to talk to anyone. Same goes for the co-pilot. You did say all the boys who fly your ships are veterans, didn't you, Paul? Yes, that's right. They're all AAF men. And that's why I came to you. To me? Uh Uh-oh, I know what's coming. Yes, Tank, you do. I need your help. I want you fellas to come along with me and help me get to the bottom of this thing before it can go any further. Hey, hey, now, wait a minute, Paul. What makes you think we can do anything? We're just a couple of ordinary flyboys. Now, don't hand me that. I know you better. Oh, why not turn this over to the police or or even the FBI? It's an interstate case. No, that would mean publicity. Bad publicity, Hop. Our airline is just getting started, and if our clients found out that our pilots were, well, seeing things, you know what would happen to our business. Out the window, but fast. Uh, I see what you mean. You've got to help me. Well... Hop, don't worry about the airport. I can handle things all right. Well, it looks like you're on Paul's side. Well, I am. I keep thinking about that poor boy we saw in New City. Whatever caused such a horrible thing must be stopped. Well, how do we know we can stop it, whatever it is? I wanted to put my money on you all the way. Well, you may be sticking your neck out, Paul, but... Do you really think we can do anything? I'm sure you can. Okay. Got yourself a deal. I know it. Here we go again. Well, you can stay behind, Tank. There's plenty of work to be done right oh, here. Oh, no, you don't, pal. You ain't leaving me out of this. Where you go, I go. Somebody's got to keep you out of trouble. <laughs> I thought so. What do you want to leave for? Anytime you say. The sooner the better. Oh, let's see. You know about the radio equipment I've ordered for the field, don't you, Gil? Yes, it's supposed to be here tomorrow or the day after. Right. Well, you see that it's installed in the little room behind the office. Now, about bookings... Don't worry about them, Hop. <laughs> say, uh, uh, can we have something to eat before we go? I can have some bacon and eggs ready in no time. Well, how about it, Paul? Can we take a half hour? Sure thing. Okay, then. We'll eat first, and by 1 o'clock, we should be on our way to New Orleans. Come on, Tank. While Gail's doing her stuff here... Leaving Gail in the kitchen, Hop, Tank, and Paul Conroy cross the road to the field and, rolling the beach craft out of its hangar, prepare it for immediate flight. Forty-five minutes later, with two portions of bacon and eggs under Tank's belt, the trim single-engine biplane is airborne on its way to New Orleans. Three planes, Paul? Yep. One DC-3 and two fours. Army surface. Well, where do you hang of them? What's your operational base? New Orleans. Of course, we usually don't have more than one ship on the field at a time. Business is pretty good. What do you carry? Anything we can fit into the planes. And do you fly regular schedules on regular routes? No, we just pick up the loads as we get them. But as I told you, we operate mostly in the south. Sounds like the way tramp steamers operate. That's it exactly. Paul, you said you were a partner in the airline. How many others are in with you? Well, there are two. I have 50% ownership since I put up half the capital. Half? Hey, you must be swimming in dope. Hardly. Right now, I'm swimming in debts and loans. I've scratched and borrowed up to my eyes to get this line going. What about your two partners? Well, they split the other 50%, 25 each. They bet, too? Yeah. 
Vinnie Stevens flew a B-29 in the Pacific. He's a good pilot and a nice guy. The other one was a ground force officer in the ETO, Air Forces Administration. Bird Craig's his name. He's got a good head for figures. He handles the business end. Well, then, what do you and Vinnie do? Oh, we just fill in whenever we're needed. Vinnie's a good boy at selling, so he tours around making contacts. Sometimes, if we're short-handed, he'll take a ship out. But me, I'm just a troubleshooter. Sounds like a neat little setup. It is, Tank. And we've been getting along fine. In the last three months, we've actually showed some black ink in the books. We're getting established, and we're getting recognized. We're a cinch to do better. Unless... Unless this enemy plane routine knocks the props out from under. Right. It's a tough setup, Paul. I hope we can do something for you. Well, I don't know what. If you ask me, it's a waste of time. Well, now, look, fellas, if... Well, I mean, if you don't want to get mixed up in this, I'd be the last guy in the world to talk you into trouble. You ain't talking us into it. We're doing all right by yourself. Well, if you honestly feel... Skip it, Paul. We're not backing out now. Well, the way Tank spoke, I... I go why. Don't you know better than to listen to me? I ain't happy listening. I got something to grouse about. We're in this with you, pal, all the way. Open up that throttle, Hop. Let's get down there and wipe this thing up in a hurry. Tank's words are brave, but they echo in the small cabin with a slightly false ring. The boys still know very little about the mystery. But even now, it seems like an impossible task. We'll bring you the gripping climax of today's episode in just a moment, gang. So stand by. (laughs) Fellas and girls, as our tribute to the Army Air Forces on its 40th anniversary, we have as our guest Colonel Robert L. Scott, Jr., the AAF Deputy Commander of the Civil Air Patrol. Colonel Scott is the author of the famous bestseller, God is My Co-Pilot and was one of America's leading aces. Colonel, I'm sure our listeners would like to hear one of your war exploits. But one day over Hong Kong, our seven fighters were intercepted by 96 Jap Zeros. It was a terrific fight. At one time, we were so close that I could see a Jap pilot's face clearly through my windshield. Things went fast and furious there, and I shot down four planes. But before heading for home base, we dove for the Peninsula Hotel which high-ranking Jap officers were using for a headquarters. I gave it a long burst and saw my bullet strike the hotel penthouse. The plate glass just exploded and fell like snow into the streets of Kowloon. Well, say, that was real flying, Colonel. But tell us, what would you say was the greatest day of your life? There's no doubt about that, Glenn. It was when I was told by General Chenault that I was to command the Flying Tigers when they came into the American Army. A real honor. Before you go, Colonel, would you uh, give a word of advice to the fellows and girls listening in? I sure would, Glenn. Very recently, Congress passed a bill making a separate Air Force. This means that the Air Force at last is coming to its own. And as we work to defend America, a grand old man named Billy Mitchell, who died for what he believed, must be smiling. He believed, and you and I join him, that America's future lies in the air. Well, thanks so very much for coming up to visit us today, Colonel Scott. And fellows and girls, remember, America needs flyers. And now back to our story. Agreeing to help their old friend Paul Conroy, Hop and Tank flew down to New Orleans with him. We find them now in the small administrative office of the Ace Flying Service at the New Orleans airport, where Conroy introduces one of his partners. Hop, Tank. I'd like you to meet Bert Craig. He's one of the boys I told you about. Hello, Bert. Hi. Hello. Bert, this is Hop Harrigan. Oh, hello, Harrigan. This is Tank Tinker. Tinker, how are you? They're old pals of mine. I've asked them to help us. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Looks like we can use help and plenty of it. Well, we'll do our best. Where's Vinny? Oh, I, he took the DC-4 out this afternoon. One of the boys reported on sick list. Mm-hmm. What about the trip going out at 7 tonight? Uh, the 3 is back in shape. The crew worked on her all day. I see. Anything new? No. And, uh, Stevens is sticking to his story. He swears he saw a messy. Mm-hmm. Is he around? I'd like to talk to him. Well, he was a few minutes ago, but I, I told him to go home and get some rest. Mm-hmm. Well, who's taking out the three tonight? Uh, Martin. Saldano's riding co-pilot for him. Good. I'll talk to them both. Well, they're probably out in the hangar, checking the ship. Right. Come on out. Tank? Okay. Back in a couple of minutes, Bert. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, didn't see you. Oh, that's okay. Hey, Martin, I'm just going out to talk to you. Uh, I want to talk to you, too, Paul. Mm-hmm. What's this about Stephen seeing a Messersmith last night? Oh, he told you, did he? Yeah, you bet he told me. And what about Frank the night before? He saw Jap Zero. How do you know that? Uh, one of the airline boys just came in from New City. He said he saw Frank blow his top. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Well, don't bother. What? If you think I'm taking that ship out tonight, you're crazy. Oh, wait a minute, Martin. I'm not sticking my neck out on a wrap like this. I'm through. I quit. Wait a minute, Martin. Yeah, and don't forget to send me my check. I got four days' pay coming. Wow. He was hitting on all cylinders, wasn't he? Quiet, thank you. Bert, call the ready room. Tell Saldana he's flying left side tonight and get one of the other boys to fill in with him. Right. Oh, 
It was a great welcome, wasn't it? Has uh, Martin been with you long? No, but I hate to lose him. He knows his business. Uh. Hello? Uh, this is Craig. Well, I only hope he hasn't spoken to any of the boys. Uh, uh, listen, Joe, Shame about that flight. airline pilot tipping off what happened what? in New City. Yeah. Well, but listen, so Danny. Well, I couldn't expect to sit on it forever. Okay, talk to you about it. I later. want to be the one to Let's tell the boys. Around, will you? Right. Paul. Hmm? All squared away? No, no, we're not. Soldano won't go up either. Uh-oh. What about the rest of the boys? No soap. I told them we'd talk to them later, but we'll be lucky if they don't quit cold on us. Why, it has to go out tonight. Uh, too bad Vinny isn't here. I guess we'll just have to cancel it. We can't. It's a new account. It's got to go through. Relax, Paul. Tank and I will take it out for you. You? Sure. I have an unlimited commercial certificate. You don't have to worry about Hop. He flies DC-3s like they was baby carriage. Hop, if you would, you'd get us out of a big hole. Okay, you've got yourself a crew. Wonderful. Well, are you sure it's all right, Paul? Positive. Couldn't have a better pilot. But he doesn't know the routine. I'll go with him. Don't worry, Bert. This will be a good chance to get some first-hand information on those enemy fighters, too. Yes, that's right. Who knows? Maybe we can blow this whole thing wide open tonight. Come on, fellas. Let's get rolling. Taking Hop and Tank by the arms, Paul Conroy literally pushes them out of the office. And 45 minutes later, after a quick check of headings and weather, they roar down the runway right on time. But as the DC-3 gains altitude and the red and green wing lights slowly disappear into the night sky, Martin, the pilot who had refused to make the trip, stands near the hangar watching the plane hot anger in his eyes. Make a monkey out of me, will they? Trying to show me up, huh? Well, let's see if they come down as easy as they went up. Fellows and girls, don't miss the next action-packed episode of The Riddle of the Ghostly Avengers. Tune in and fly with Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. So long, Hop! We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Hop Harrigan is a transcribed copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines. All right, everyone, that is the end of the first half of the listen along. Um, have your five minute break, and then we'll come back and do the rest. Cool. See you in five minutes. Bye, guys.
All right, this marks the end of the five minute break. Here comes part two. Woo! Presenting Hop Harrigan, America's ace of the airways. CX-4 calling control tower. CX-4 calling control tower. Standing by. Control tower back to CX-4. Wind southeast. Ceiling 1200. All clear. Okay. This is Hop Harrigan coming in. Yes, it's America's ace of the airways. Coming in for another transcribed episode in the adventures of Hop Harrigan. Gang, I want you to meet the first girl to work her way around the world. She's Miss Alice Lemieux, one of Pan American Airways' chief stewardesses, who just recently returned from the first round-the-world passenger flight. Alice, how did you happen to be chosen to make that historic flight? Is it because you're pretty as a picture? Thanks for the compliment, Glenn, but these days airline hostesses have to be more than pretty. It helps, though, doesn't it? Yes, I suppose so, except in Tokyo. Oh, I don't get that. Well, when we landed in Tokyo, the famous passengers on board the plane were supposed to be greeted by top-ranking army generals. Everything was going along fine until I made the mistake of stepping out on the field. Well, why was it a mistake? Well, about a thousand homesick GIs had come down to see the plane land, and when they saw me, they whistled so loud no one could hear what the generals were saying. (laughs) Making you not only the first girl to work her way around the world, but the first girl responsible for GIs drowning out a general. Uh, How many flights have you taken with Pan Am, Alice? About 50 transatlantic crossings in the last 18 months. That's a lot of air travel. It's a lot of walking, too. Walking? Afraid I don't understand. Uh Uh-oh, I see it's time for today's Hop Harrigan episode. But don't go away, Alice. I still want to know what you mean by walking. And I'm sure a lot of our girl listeners would like some inside dope on how to become an airline hostess. I'll be back at the end of the program, Graham. Okay, we'll be looking forward to it. You heard that, gang, so keep listening. And now to our story. Intrigued by the report that two airline pilots had been attacked by wartime enemy fighter planes, and anxious to help their friend Paul Conroy, part owner of the airline, Hop and Tank left Lakeville with him and flew south to New Orleans. There they saw concrete evidence of what was happening. Afraid of the mysterious ghost-like fighters, Conroy's pilots refused to take a cargo flight on its scheduled night run, whereupon Hop and Tank immediately volunteered their services, hoping to see the fighters for themselves. As we continue now, the heavily laden DC-3 is two hours out, holding a steady course northeastward toward its destination, Richmond, Virginia. The flight thus far has been smooth and uneventful. Ah, What did you say, Tank? It's a lot of hokum. Them guys must have dreamed up them enemy fighters. Why do you say that? Listen, Conroy, we've been flying for more than two hours now, and what's happened? Nothing. This is a milk run. Well, we still have three and a half hours to go, fellas. Plenty of time to run into trouble. Besides, why stick your neck out asking for it? What do you think we're making the trip for, anyhow? We want to see them messies and zeros for ourselves. Uh, I can't help hoping we don't. Hey, listen, Paul, one thing we never did get straight. Exactly where were they spotted? Where did your two boys see them? Well, the first night, Frank was on a run from New Orleans to Cheyenne. He wasn't flying the air lane, and he saw it about an hour north of Oklahoma City. And that's desert country up that way, isn't it? Uh Uh-huh. And last night, the Messerschmitt was spotted on a trip from Kansas City back to New Orleans, somewhere near Little Rock. Oklahoma and Little Rock, about 300 miles apart, huh? Uh-huh. We're about 450 miles east of Little Rock now. It'll be interesting to see if they show up again. Hey, Hop. Huh? Do you have any idea what they can be? I'm afraid I'll have to see them first. Hey, what's that? What? Way out, 3 o'clock and high. Oh, yes, you see, Hop? Yeah. What do you think? Oh, well, maybe we'll get some action. Relax, both of you. What do you mean, relax? You're getting too worked up. It's only an airline transport. You sure? Positive. Oh, nuts. Are we sure we latched on to something? No. No, Hop's right. Must be a transport going into Atlanta. He's holding course. Oh, God, it. I wish something would happen. His homely features twisted into a disgruntled skull. Tank literally begs for trouble as he resumes his vigil, staring into the night sky, looking for a sign of the mysterious enemy fighters. Nothing happens. The DC-3 drones steadily northeastward, 
its engines humming smoothly as the propellers bite through the calm night air. Then, as Hop concludes his radio check with a range station at Spartanburg, he stirs uneasily. Well, things are getting a little tight. What do you mean, tight? There's a low-pressure area coming in from the northwest, and it's loaded. Stars are out. The sky is like a milk pond. That's just it. It's too quiet. I don't like it. I feel like I'm sitting on a cake of dynamite. We'll be in Richmond in a couple of hours. Yeah, we have to cross mountain terrain first, and the Blue Ridge chains no picnic ground with weather. Ah, forget it. So what if we run into a little glow? We can plow through okay. Hey, that's starting. Where's it coming from? The sky's still clear. Look down. Uh-oh. Can't see the beacon. Yeah, it crept in under us. Look over to the west. <whistles> Stars are gone. Stuff's rolling in thick and fast. Did you say a little blow tank? My mistake. Watch it. Hang on. Take your belts. It's going to get a lot rougher. I'm okay. Paul? She's tight. I wanted to see them ghost planes. You'll see more than ghosts on this trip, pal. Oh, brother, did you see that flash of lightning? Yeah. It'd be pretty, too, if we was on the ground. The storm is coming in north, right across our heading. You think we'd better find an alternate field and sit this dance out? Tank, get on the radio and call the Spartanburg range. Find out if anything's open. Roger. Why don't you ease off to the east a little more, huh? Maybe we can run around the edge of the blow. Can't, not till I get clearance. Might fly straight into another plane's route. Ah, no soaps. Can't hear a thing. Too much static. Okay, cut it. Cut. They're up. Yeah. What are you going to do? Hold tight and plow through. And listen, if you're on speaking terms with Lady Luck, start giving her an earful. We can use her right now. As a blazing blue-white streak of lightning flashes across the sky directly in front of them, Hop's face is tense, his forehead deeply lined. The storm closes in rapidly around the heavy DC-3, and as the whirling winds of many thunderheads toss the plane through the sky, the wings and fuselage groan and creak in protest. Tank and Paul Conroy sit rigid, bracing themselves as the ship bucks and plunges, listening for and yet dreading the tearing, rending sound which will signal damage to the plane structure. But even though the fury of the storm redoubles, they wallow through the sky in a drunken dance of death. Hop manages to hold his altitude and keep the ship in the air. Great Scott, how long can this last? Tank, any break in the clouds? No, uh, still piled up like a brick wall. Can't we go any higher? Crowding our ceiling with this load now. Hang on! We're going down! Yeah. Ah, pull her out or we'll kick them out and sure. Come on, baby, don't shed your wings now. Get that stick back, will you? Come on, come on, nose up. Gently does it. We're breaking out of it. Keep your fingers crossed now. All the way. Ah. Nice going, huh? Hey, what's that? It's up to the midships. Good Lord. What is it, Paul? The cargo's broken loose. It's pounding the air both head to pieces. Then get after it. Or we'll be ripped apart. Even as Hop shouts his frantic warning, Tank and Paul Conroy leap out of their seats and dash into the cargo cabin, where two massive crates pound and smash against the rear bulkhead wall, threatening to break the plane in two. Gang, there's a startling surprise ahead, so stand by. And here back with us again is Alice Lemieux, one of Pan American Airways' chief stewardesses. Now, about that walking business, Alice, just what did you mean? On each transatlantic clipper trip to England or Portugal, I walk approximately 11 miles up and down the aisle of the plane, seeing to it that passengers are comfortable and serving their meals. On the round of world flight, I must have walked 50 miles. Well, here's hoping you never have to fly to the moon. <laughs> But seriously, Alice, uh, what does it take to become an airline stewardess? Do you need a college degree? It helps, but you don't need one. If you have a college degree, you must have at least two years of business experience. You must be over 21, be neat, and have a pleasant personality. And, of course, you must love flying. Well, would you advise it as a career for girls, just as Hoff advises boys to become pilots? I certainly would. The future of aviation is almost unlimited, and anyone who starts now is bound to grow with it. Then, too, it's a wonderful opportunity to travel, to see the world, and to meet all sorts of interesting people. Well, what about foreign languages? Do you have to know how to speak them? Not on airlines in the United States, but you do on Pan American. As a matter of fact, one of the main reasons I was chosen for the round-the-world flight is because I speak French fluently. Et vous n'avez en France? 
Non, je suis né dans l'état du Maine, mais j'ai appris à parler français quand j'étais petit. <laughs> Translation? I asked Alice if she was born in France, and she said no, she was born in Maine, but learned French as a child. Right, Mamsel? Right, monsieur. Well, thank you so much, Alice, for being with us today, and wherever you may fly, happy landings. Thank you very much, Glenn. And gang, always remember, America needs flyers. And now, back to our story. En route to Richmond, Virginia, in a DC-3, on what first appeared to be a routine cargo flight, Hop, Tank, and Paul Conroy have flown into a raging storm while over the dangerous Blue Ridge Mountains. Now, as the plane skids and plunges wildly, Tank and Conroy fight to secure the heavy cargo, which has broken loose and threatens to pound the plane to bits. Paul, grab that crate before it flies through the bulkhead. I can't reach it. I can't even stand on my feet. Hop! Hop, hurry up, will you? The ship's getting heavy. She's out of trim. Can't you hold her level? I don't know. She's riding tail heavy. We won't have any tail if we don't tie those crates back. Paul, oh, look out! Oh, murder! That was close and clear. Let me in there. Thank God. We smashed against the bulkhead. I gotta get behind it. If I can hold her back, maybe you can snub a rope around it. But tie her. Grab the rope and move when I tell you. Please, tight, you'll get hurt. Stand back. Now. Hop, yeah. Keep the nose down. Tanks between the crate and the bulkhead. Paul, now! Get the rope around it, right? Watch it. I can't keep her down. You've got to. Hurry up with that rope. Tank, the crate's sliding back. Get out. I'm holding her. You get the rope around it. That's it. Once more. There. Oh, that do it. Now, you get out of there. That rope breaks again. Oh, I ain't taking no chance. It's gonna be me or the ship, then, then it's me. So, making a human cushion of himself, Tank leans against the bulkhead and, by sheer brute strength, holds the crate in place. Then, as suddenly as it started, the storm begins to slacken, and the ship gradually rides more and more smoothly. Finally, after 15 minutes. Okay, relax. We're in the clear. Thank goodness for that. Wow. My arm's stiff. I don't think I'll ever get them down again. Well, let me rub them for you. Get the circulation going. Yeah, I'll be okay. Just stretch a couple of times. Well, you did a swell job. We'd have lost the whole tail section if it hadn't been for you. Yeah, forget it. Say, you want to get some new rations aboard. Yeah. Just wait till I see the ground crew that serviced this ship. They should have checked them before we went out. Here's the one that broke loose. Hey, what's keeping you guys? Come on up forward. Right with you. Hey, Paul. Huh? Look at this. No wonder it couldn't haul the crates. The belt's been cut halfway through. His hands trembling, Tank holds the webbed strap out. And in the flickering light from the overhead dome, Paul Conroy sees a clean, straight gash halfway across the width of the lashing. So what was seemingly an accident is now definitely sabotage. Just how does this new development fit into the pattern of the mysterious enemy fighters? We'll learn more in the next suspense-packed episode of The Riddle of the Ghostly Avengers. So be sure to listen. Tune in and fly with Pop Harrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Pop Harrigan is a transcribed, copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines. Yes, that's the plan of the Army Air Forces. 
Almost every new plane we hear about these jet days is jet propelled. Recently on Hop Harrigan, we told you about many of these new ships. Now we're going to tell you about another one, a bomber, one of the latest models of the Air Forces. This is the Martin Belt XB-48, and it's the largest multi-jet bomber of regular design. It's also the first bomber with six jet engines, a very powerful ship with high speed. Many of the performance details are still secret, and tests are being made to find out just what it can do under all conditions. To give you an idea of how powerful this aircraft is, here are some of the details on the engines. Now, as I told you before, it has six made by General Electric. They are housed three in each wing. The maximum power of these engines is greater than that of two giant electric railroad engines, each pulling a string of 25 freight cars. Well, that's some power, isn't it, gang? The ship itself is trim, and it's really good-looking. It's over 85 feet long and stands 27 and a half feet above the ground. As in all jet planes, the wings are very thin, and from tip to tip, 108 feet long. The Martin Company built the XB-48 in the shortest time possible, taking only 14 months to finish it. Most planes have to be worked on for more than two years before they're ready to fly. Fellas and girls, in just a few minutes, I'll be back to tell you more about the Martin XB-48, the largest all-jet airplane, so don't forget to listen. And now to our story. Fearful of another mysterious attack by ghostly wartime enemy fighter planes, the flight crews of the Ace Flying Service refused to make a scheduled night cargo run, so Hop and Tank volunteered to take over. With Paul Conroy, one-third owner of the airline, the boys took off from New Orleans in a heavily laden DC-3 heading for Richmond, Virginia, hoping to see these enemy fighters for themselves. But they ran headlong into trouble from another source, weather and were forced to fly through a violent storm over the Blue Ridge Mountains, at the height of which the cargo suddenly broke loose, threatening to pound the ship to bits. Only Tank's tremendous strength saved them from destruction. Then, finally, when the weather eased off and the boys could relax once again, Tank made a startling discovery, a discovery which he carries forward to the flight compartment to show up. Ah, ah look at this. What? This strap. It was one of the lashings that held the crates in place there. Ah, look at it. Oh, that the one that snapped? Snapped all right. Do you see why? Why, it's been cut. Huh? But it was still strong enough to hold the cargo. That is until weather set in and the going got rough. Ah, cut's fairly clean. Must have been done just before we took off. Yeah, by one of the guys in your own airline, too, Paul. Who could it possibly be? You got me. One of the grease monkeys, maybe? Or that guy Martin, the one who got sore and quit. Tank, that's impossible. Well, to say there wasn't no ghost, which brings up another point. Is this sabotage tied in with those enemy fighters in any way? I don't see how. You haven't seen any on this trip. Just a thought. Well, you better strap in now. We're in the Richmond control zone. I'll call the tower and check in. Richmond Tower from Ace Flight 19. As Hop makes his routine call to the control tower in preparation for a landing, Tank and Paul Conroy fasten their seat belts. Tank first tucking the cut strap safely away in his pocket. Five minutes later, they're safely on the ground, and after unloading the cargo, Hop and Tank go to the small airport diner, where they wait for Paul to conclude the necessary clearance formalities. Uh, Tank, what do you think? You want a straight answer? Well, of course I do. I think we got ourselves into a dirty little mess. Unless when we watch our step, we'll be shipped home in a couple of boxes. Well, then you're sure the strap was cut to make us crack up? Well, how else can you figure it? Well, we didn't take over until the very last minute. Martin was supposed to have made the flight originally. There was still enough time for somebody to go into the cabin and cut the strap. Uh, I suppose so. Hey, Joe. Yep? Give me a repeat on the milk and pie. Coming up. But look at it this way, Tank. There'd be no reason to kill us. Nobody knew why we came to New Orleans. Bert Craig knows what the score is. Ah, oh, don't be ridiculous, Tank. And that guy Martin knows something's up. Or we wouldn't have taken the ship out. Well, you could say that about any one of the pilots. One apple pie and one milk. Thanks. Anything for you, Chief? Uh, no, no thanks. Look. Paul Conroy was with us. Maybe somebody's after him. Yeah, but he wasn't supposed to go. He only came because we didn't know the routine. Uh, we seem to be traveling in circles, don't we? Well, I got the strap safe in my pocket. And if I ever find out who did it, I'll shove it right down his throat. Shove what down whose throat? Huh? Oh, hello, Paul. Oh, come on, sit down. Thanks. What was Tank saying? Yeah, nothing important. How about something you need? No, no, thanks. I just spoke to Bert. Told him about it. Uh, what did he say? He didn't believe it at first. But he's going to investigate. He's going to find out who loaded the cargo and if anybody went aboard who didn't belong on the ship. Well, if you ask me, he won't get far. Half a dozen guys could have gone inside her without nobody asking questions. Well, that's about all he can do. 
But he thinks he can talk the crews into coming back to work because we didn't see any zeros or messies. Now, that's something. Well, what do we do now? Pick up another load? No. Now we go back empty. When do we leave? Anytime you say. We can stay overnight and get some sleep if you like. Yeah, there's no point in that. Well, the ship's gassed up and ready. Just say the word. Finish up, Tank, and let's get rolling. Okay. Just let me finish my pie. Keep your shirt on. I'll be right with you. Tri-City range from Ace Flight 19, altitude 6,000 feet, airspeed indicated 180, holding course 205, destination New Orleans, over. Ace 19 from Tri-City range, you are clear, hold course and altitude, over. Any weather? Over. Scattered clouds, no turbulence, over. Okay, thanks. Ace 19, out. Tri-City range, out. Huh? I'll take over any time you want me to. Oh, thanks, Paul, but I'm not tired. Why don't you go back and cork off for a while? Oh, tank snoring bother you. No, I couldn't sleep. Are you worried? What do you think? This is the first time in months a ship of ours has come home empty. You always manage to pick up a cargo. Ah, well, that's bound to happen sometime. Can't be helped. Yes, it can, Hop. There's a leak. The dispatcher at Richmond asked me if we'd seen any more enemy planes. Oh? Uh-huh. That's why there wasn't any return cargo. The shippers know there's trouble. They're not taking any chances. I get it. Bad news travels fast. Not without help, it doesn't. First enemy planes, then sabotage, and now somebody's talking too much. Well, it looks like we've got our work cut out for us. Turning back to the controls, Hop opens the throttle another notch, sending the DC-3 roaring ahead through the night sky. A little after six in the morning, they sight the narrow winding channel of the Mississippi and, following it straight into New Orleans, are on the ground 15 minutes later, taxiing toward the hangar on which is the sign, Ace Flying Service. Spot the crew chief for me, Tank. Give me a signal. Hey, he's waving us straight in. We're okay. There's birds standing by the office door. He sure keeps early hours. He's been running himself ragged the past couple of days. He hop, he's off in the left. Left, Roger. Run around. Okay, cut. Right. All right, fellas, pile out. Clear, four. Hey, wait a minute. Where's Vinny's ship? You mean the DC-4? Yes. You see if it's in the hangar? Uh, I can't see from here. Well, we'll find out quick enough. Go ahead. All right. Hey, Vinny was flying a load out to El Paso, wasn't he? Yes. Birch coming out to meet us. He'll give you the lowdown. Go on, Tank. Jump. Hello, Paul. Bird, hasn't Vinny come in yet? No, he was due at six, half past five. Well, what's holding him up? Hasn't he checked in? He checked in 45 minutes ago. And? He said a Jap Mitsubishi fighter was attacking him. We haven't heard anything since. Craig's voice is flat and toneless. There's no trace of emotion on his features as he breaks the shocking news. So the mysterious enemy strikes again. We'll know more about it in a moment, gang, so stand by. At the beginning of Hop Harrigan, we went over some of the details of the Army's new jet bomber, the Martin XB-48. Now, let's learn some more about this new ship. Because of the thin wings necessary for high speeds, the XB-48 is pioneering a new, specially designed bicycle-type landing gear. It was built specifically for planes flying close to the speed of sound. There's no room in the thin supersonic wings to house the large wheels needed for safe landings and takeoffs. So in the new system, the two main wheels are placed bicycle style in the center of the ship. When not in use, they retract upward into the fuselage. A smaller wheel is located near the tip of each wing to keep it balanced during taxi operations. And these retract into shallow openings in the wings. The Martin people have been experimenting with this new landing gear for a long time. As a matter of fact, some time ago, they equipped a B-26 Marauder with the main wheels in the fuselage and outrigger-type balancing wheels in the wings. Many landings and takeoffs were made to test the gear, and it was proven very valuable to the stability of high-speed planes. In the test flights of the XB-48, Army officers and company officials are watching the performance of the new landing gear very closely, because one of the major problems in building heavy jet ships has been the location of the wheels. 
Now, if this tandem-type gear works out as well as expected, the problem will be solved. When the test flights are complete, we'll be able to tell you more. Meanwhile, fellas and girls, if you're thinking of working in the aircraft industry someday, make sure you keep in good trim physically. And don't neglect to train your mind as well. It'll take brains to make the grade in the air age. The future of the air is your future. So always remember, America needs flyers. And now back to our story. Returning to New Orleans in the early morning, Hawk Tank and Paul Conroy were met by Bert Craig, a partner in the airline, who informed them... Vinnie reported 45 minutes ago. He said a Jap Mitsubishi fighter was attacking him. We haven't heard anything since. Now a half hour has passed. A half hour of frantic phone calls and tense, anxious waiting... Hawk Tank and two Ace Flying Service partners are in the small operations office. Craig is seated quietly behind his desk. Paul paces the floor nervously. And Hawk and Tank stand by the window, hoping and praying for a glimpse of their missing partner in his DC-4. What could have happened to him? He didn't crash or the workers would have been found by now. The planes don't just vanish into thin air. Take it easy, Paul. Running a rat race around the office won't help now. I'm going to have to do something. Craig, yes? Did Vinny say why he was flying late? He should have been within 15 minutes of the field according to his schedule, but he was a good 300 miles away. Uh, he said he'd explain when he got in. We could only do something. How much gas was he carrying? Enough for an extra hour's flight beyond his destination. Uh, he's got about 15 minutes left. Yeah, if he's still in the air... Get that quick. Okay, relax, Paul. Ace Flying Service. He has when? Vinny? Hold it, Paul. Well, where is he? Okay, thanks. Well, he's coming in. He just reported to the tower. Should be over the field any second. Hey, look. Is that him? Let me see. There, north of the tower. High. Four engine job. Yes, come on outside. Right, would you? Harrigan. Yes? I... I didn't give Paul the whole message from the tower. Well? Well, there's been an accident. The co-pilot's unconscious and Vinny can't see. He can't possibly land the ship. For a moment, Hop is motionless, and then suddenly the full impact of the situation hits him, and he rushes to the door of the office and stares up at the DC-4, slowly circling the field. How can the pilot, blinded, land the ship? There's spine-tingling action in the next episode of The Riddle of the Ghostly Avengers, so don't miss it, gang. <laughs> Tune in and fly with Pop, Harrigan, and America's Ace of the Airways. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you, same time, same mutual station. Pop Harrigan is a transcribed, copyrighted feature appearing in all American comics magazines. can now be eliminated almost completely by a shoebox-sized radar device invented by that great aviator and plane designer, Howard Hughes? Well, according to Mr. Hughes, his new anti-crash warning system can prevent at least 96% of these accidents. Not only is this invention an important advance in making our planes safer, but it's so simple that anybody can understand how it works. An amber light flashes and a bell rings when the plane comes within 2,000 feet of an obstacle, such as a mountain or building, directly ahead or below it. So as soon as the pilot hears and sees these warning signals, he goes into a climb and within a few minutes is out of danger. 
The device also can be set to work at 500 feet to help the plane land. And it works in any kind of weather. Radar has been the white hope of aviation engineers, pilots, and the public ever since it was first installed in planes during the war. But wartime radar was a very complicated mechanism. To use wartime radar, our airline pilots had to be specially trained to read the radar scope. Since the war, in order to determine obstacles in their course, pilots have been comparing readings of their barometric and flight maps. Then they figure out their average speed and wind drift and compare the whole business with what they can see. As you can well imagine, all this takes time, sometimes too much time. In just a few minutes, I'll be back to tell you more about Howard Hughes' new anti-crash radar device, so don't forget to listen. And now to our story. If Paul Conroy and his two partners were to keep their charter airline in operation, they needed help. So Hop and Tank took on the job of discovering, if possible, what was behind the mysterious attacks by ghost-like wartime enemy fighter planes. But before they could make any progress, Vinnie Stevens, one of the partners, reported by radio that he was being attacked by a Jap Mitsubishi while en route to New Orleans in a DC-4 transport. For nearly an hour and a half, nothing further was heard from him. And then the control tower reported the ship near the field, apparently trying to come in for a landing. As we continue now, Hop and Tank are running across the field, following Paul Conroy, while the transport circles overhead. Tank, he can't make it. He'll never be able to bring the ship in by himself. Why not? Craig didn't tell Conroy, but there's been an accident. Oh, I thought the nose what kind of fun. That's almost all smashed in, and the cockpit windows are all broken. That won't keep a good pilot from landing. All right, here we are, fellas. We'll go right up to the transmitter, and we'll talk to Vinny ourselves. Paul, wait. We can't wait. Something's wrong, or Vinny wouldn't keep circling. I'd better talk to him. Paul, listen to me. I know what's wrong. What? There's been an accident. The co-pilot's unconscious, and Vinny's... Blind. Blind? Jump the jetty. Well, how do you know? Craig got it from the tower operator. Well, why didn't he tell me? Hey, he didn't want you to blow your top, so when you talk to Vinny, take it easy, will you? Take it easy. Hop, we've got to help him. Come on. Hop. What? What about Vinny? Is there any way we can get him down? Well, we'll have to wait until we hear from him and find out exactly what the score is. Hey, Sparks. Oh, hello, Mr. Conroy. Are you in contact with Stevens? Yeah, tough break, ain't it? I got the crash truck standing by. All right, let me talk to him. Sure thing. Hello, Stevens in Ace 2 9. This is the tower. Come in. Over. Stevens here. Am I still near the field? Over. Yeah, you're over the north boundary. Keep circling. Here's Mr. Conroy. He wants to talk to you. Stand by. Okay, Mr. Conroy. Hello, Vinny. This is Paul. Hi. I got myself into a sweet mess. Trying to save the ship, but don't know if I can do it. Hang the ship. What about you? You hurt badly? Got smacked up around the face. Can't see. Makes it tough. Can't you see anything at all? Nope. Gosh. Hold it, Tank. Listen, you've got a couple of shoots in the locker. Bail out. I can't. There's something happened to Pete. I can never get a shoot on him, and I won't leave him. How much gas is left? I don't know, but it can't be more than a teacup full of that. Oh, Lord. Paul, let me talk to him, will you? Hop, is there anything we can do? Well, it depends on how good he is at following orders. Hello, Vinny. Go ahead. I'm putting on a friend of mine. Hop Harrigan. Here he is. Hello, Stevens. This is Harrigan. Hi. Paul's told me a lot about you. Sorry I won't get a chance to meet you in person. Maybe you will. Listen, did you ever make any landings on a ground control approach? Yeah, a couple in service. There's no GCA unit down there. We don't need one. We can see you fine. I wish I could say the same. I'm going to try and talk you in. Do you think you can follow my orders without question? Well, I'll try. You've got to do more than try, fella. Okay, Harrigan. It's a cinch I haven't anything to lose. Take over. All right. Keep circling. I'll get a car and a portable transmitter and talk you in from the runway. Stand by now. Hey, Sparks. I'm way ahead of you, sir. There's a Jeep with a short wave set in it parked in back of the administration building. You can use that. Fine. Come on, Tank. I'll stay here, Hop, and keep in touch with Vinny. Good idea. Don't let him drift away from the field. On the double now, Tank. We've got to move fast. Taking the tower stairs two at a time, Hop and Tank rush out on the field, quickly locate the Jeep. And with Tank at the wheel, race madly out to the head of the runway. In the back seat, Hop makes contact with the still circling transport. Hello, Stevens. Hello, Stevens. How do you hear me? How do you hear me? Come in. Over. Okay, Harrigan. Getting it fine. Over. Now stand by. Hello, Tower. Are you listening? Come in. Over. This is Paul, Hop. Go ahead. Give me exact wind velocity and direction. Hold it. Here's the runway. Where do you want me to park? Right in the middle. Check. Hello, Hop. This is Paul. Go ahead. Wind velocity 12 to 14 miles from due south. Thanks. It's okay here? Fine. Cut the engine. Right. Now, Tank, keep your fingers crossed. I got my eyes crossed, too. Hello, Vinny. Are you ready? Anytime you are, pal. Okay, let's get to work. You're now west of the field, about a half mile, flying parallel with the row of hangars. Got that? Perfectly. What's my altitude? Roughly about 3,000. You'll have to come down. You're telling me. Chop back your throttles and lower your nose now. Roger. Easy now, not too much. Okay. You're now southwest of the field. Give me a 90-degree turn to the left. 90 to the left. It'll be a stab in the dark, but here goes. 
Not if he ain't giving her enough rudder. Hello, Vinny. Get your foot down on that left pedal. Your turn's too shallow. Roger. That's better. Okay, far enough. Level out. And keep your nose down. I'm trying to. I can't help feeling that I'm going to plow up the ground any second. You've still got a good 1,500 feet. Trust me, Vinny. Okay, pal. Sorry. Now, stand by for another 90 to the left. You're almost over the water tower at the southeast corner of the field. Check. All right, hit it. Get that wheel over. Coming around. Hey, he's doing it smoother this time. Hold it, Vinny. Hold it. Now, break it. Level up. Nice going. This is murder. Now, listen. You're in your downwind leg. Lower your gear and give a flaps. Gear and flaps. Check it. Hope I can find the handle. On your right, Vinny. Both of them. Okay. Got them. There go the wheels. Good. And the flaps. He's really on the ball, that guy. Okay, Vinny, you're doing fine. Now chop back the throttles a little more. Throttles back. Check. What about the altitude? Less than a thousand. Vinny, level out. You're down far enough. I feel like I'm right on top of the tree. No, you've got enough room. Now, is everything under control? As near as I can get it. And stand by for another turn. We'll put you on your base leg. Harrigan. I... I'm getting scared. Relax. You'll be okay. Lean on that wheel now and cut around. Roger. He sounds nervous. If I were in his shoes, I'd be ready for a straitjacket. Okay, Vinny, level out. You're in the base leg. Check. Hello, Tower, come in. Right, standing by. I'm going to try to bring him in. Have everything ready. Do you understand? Oh, yeah, sure. Stop trying to play cagey and get those crash wagons out fast. I'm going to need them. Relax, Vinny, you're doing fine. Cut the chatter. Stand by for your last turn, Vinny. Last is right. Go ahead now, hit it. Roger. He's making it awful tight. He's off, Vinny, not so sharp. Roger. Now, straight and level again. Straight and level. You're about a mile and a half away. Drop your nose, but not too much. Nose down. Check. But God, he's dragging the left wing. Then he'd get the stick over. Left wing's low. Check. How close am I? A mile now, and you're lined up perfectly. Hold it that way. Harrigan. Harrigan, I... I can't do it. Yes, you can. Hold her steady. He's drifting to the right. A little left rudder now, Vinny, and easy does it, boy. Where... Where am I now? Less than half a mile from the runway. Keep coming. Tank, start up. Roger. Pull over to the grass when I tell you. Harrigan. Harrigan, come in. Where am I? You're all set for the touchdown, pal. When I count five, close down your throttles all the way. Understand? Count five. Cut the engines. Right. Okay, Tank, get off the runway. You bet. Now, Vinny, this is it. One, two, three. His eyes glued to the steadily approaching Four. transport. Hop counts off slowly, sweating the massive plane in. One mistake, the slightest miscalculation now, will mean a fatal crash. Gang, in a minute you'll hear the gripping climax of today's episode, so stand by. Howard Hughes recently took a plane load of the nation's leading aviation writers up in a constellation to demonstrate his new anti-crash radar device. To show what it could do, he flew until he was opposite the steep mountains beyond Santa Monica, California, mountains which have crushed in their stony fingers many a fog-bound plane. Hughes flew the plane directly toward the highest peak. His passengers held their breath. Suddenly a bell rang, a light flashed when the radar cat's whisker brushed the rising ground ahead and below. Pilot Hughes immediately adjusted the controls, the ship roared up into a steep climb, and cleared the rocks in plenty of time. The passengers aboard were profoundly impressed, to say the least. Well, that day, newspaper wires buzzed with stories of the spectacularly successful demonstration. This new airline radar system, which weighs only 15 pounds and costs only $130, sends out brief bursts of high-frequency pulses or waves both ahead of the plane and below it. When these pulses echo back from the ground or from the sea or buildings, a receiving apparatus measures the time the waves take to make the round trip. Well, all this is as quick as a wink. If any waves return fast enough to indicate that an obstacle is within 2,000 feet of the plane... The light and bell go into action, and the pilot immediately pulls his plane into a climb. In many parts of the country where mountains aren't so steep, he would be warned of an approaching peak as much as 30 miles in advance. The Air Safety Board, appointed by President Truman, was recently shown this invention in action, and 10 days later, they recommended that all airlines be required to install anti-crash radar. Yes, fellows and girls, the pilot's life is just as exciting as it ever was, only it's being made easier and safer all the time. And gang, always remember, America needs flyers. And now, back to our story. Hop and Tank are seated at the head of the runway in a jeep, using a shortwave radio to talk Vinnie Stephens' DC-4 into a safe landing. Now, 
Huff measures off the time to a touchdown as he watches the huge transport come closer. Three, four, five, 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 five. Cut the throttle, Vinny. You're right over the concrete. Here goes nothing. Lady Lux, stay with him. No sound, Vinny. No sound. His wheels are touching. He's in, Hop. He's in. Okay, Vinny, you're down. Hold us steady. Hello, Hop. This is Paul. Come in. Go ahead, Paul. Is he all right? Of course he is. He did a beautiful job. Now go on out there and meet him. Right. Talk to you later. There, he stopped. Everything's okay now. Hop, you were swell. Oh, thanks. Now, thank get this crate rolling before I pass out. His knees suddenly turning to water, Hop slumps in the back seat as Tank starts the Jeep. And after the two injured flyers are taken to the local hospital, Hop and Tank give the damaged plane a careful examination. Boy, she sure took an awful wallop in the snoot. No wonder the nose wheel came down at all. No wonder the whole control cabin didn't fold up. What did Vinny say happened? Did the jet plane crash into him head on? Yes, and burned. They were awful lucky to come out alive. It was more than a luck, Tank. Huh? What do you mean? Something's wrong somewhere. I believe Vinny's story. I'm sure he wasn't lying. But I'll bet my bottom dollar this ship was never hit by a Jap fighter. It was never hit by a plane at all. Hop has made an astonishing statement. But if the DC-4 wasn't hit by a plane, what did happen to it? Gang, there are plenty of surprises ahead, so don't miss the next episode of The Riddle of the Ghostly Avenger. Tune in and fly with Hop Carrigan, America's ace of the airwaves. So long, Hop. We'll be seeing you same time, same mutual station. Hop Harrigan is a transcribed copyrighted feature appearing in All-American Comics magazine.